Okay, so for, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come here to participate in this program and uh, come back to the place where I was a postdoc, where I know many people, many friends, and to give this colloquium. So I gave a provocative title, Testing Theory with Cosmological Observations. And I should mention that I'm aiming this colloquium at uh, those of you who are not working in cosmology. I'm sort of, uh, string theory was not in that sentence, not working in cosmology. Now, there are some of you who are actually not working on string theory. So, and those who are not working on string theory may have read some popular articles criticizing uh, string theory, claiming that string theory is not physics, it has nothing to do with anything that can be measured. So my first goal in this colloquium is to show you that this is not the case. So the way that I'll do that is I'm going to make a prediction for cosmological observations, which is based on real stringy physics. This uh, prediction will come, will be related to gravitational waves. And uh, it's not something that you'll be able to measure tomorrow or one year from now or five years from now, but I've witnessed the spectacular progress in observational cosmology over the last 20 years. So the prediction I'm going to make is for something that on a time scale of 10 years might very well be measurable. So now if, you, if the results of these gravitational wave detections will come in the way that I predict, then this will first of all be a prediction which was first made from string theory. So what else could you mean by testing string theory with cosmological observations? And secondly, it would also rule out the current paradigm of early universe cosmology. So now I have a second goal of my colloquium. So to make this prediction, I will have to go beyond the current paradigm of early universe cosmology. And the current paradigm of early universe cosmology is the inflationary universe scenario. So I will be proposing a different stringy early universe scenario. And it is in the context of this scenario that the prediction will come about. And so the second goal of my colloquium is to persuade those of you working on string theory and cosmology that it is not necessary to embed inflation into string theory in order to make contact with observations. Okay. So hopefully the computer didn't freeze during this long time, no? So the outline of my colloquium is as follows. I'll first give you a brief review of the current paradigm, the inflationary universe scenario. I'll mention some of the issues which have brought me to look beyond inflationary cosmology. Then I will introduce um, my this alternative scenario called string gas cosmology, which goes back to work that I did uh, 20 years ago with Kuhn und Waffer. Um, I will actually need an assistant. And Damien, can, I, can you be my assistant? Can, um, could you get, I realize that I forgot my prop. So c could you, uh, go and see Jocelyn and ask her for an elastic band. <laughs> okay, so I'll be introducing my, um, this string gas cosmology scenario. Then I will show you how string gas cosmology gives rise to a structure formation scenario which is different from the inflationary structure formation scenario. I'll make the predictions and I'll show some new results for signatures in the cosmic microwave background and isotopy maps, and then I'll conclude. And then for experts, I have something prepared if I get the questions. Okay, here's my introduction. So the current paradigm of early universe cosmology is the inflationary universe scenario, and the inflationary universe scenario was very successful because it solved some of the problems of the old scenario, the standard Big Bang scenario. It explains why the universe is approximately homogeneous, why it's approximately spatially flat, and why it has a huge amount of entropy and why it is so large. But from our current perspective, 
the most interesting fact is that the inflationary universe provided the first causal mechanism for generating primordial cosmological perturbations. So we now, as of 2000, have these beautiful maps of the cosmic microwave background. So this is a projection of the sky onto a plane. Different colors mean different temperatures. And you see structure. You can quantify the structure by expanding the map in spherical harmonics and plotting the power in each spherical harmonic. So harmonic, so it's large angular scales, small angular scales, power. The uh, black dots are the results which we now have as of 2000. And the red curve is the curve that was predicted a year or so after inflation was developed. 19, we're talking about approximately 1980, 20 years before the data. So this is a spectacular phenomenological success. I mean, you have to tune a couple of parameters to get this success. Um, but it's spectacular phenomenological success. However, there's a footnote that I'd like to make, a historical footnote. Um, all that you need to get this spectacular success is a scale invariant spectrum of primordial adiabatic perturbations. And you can't see the text here, but what I want to point you out is that this is a 1970 paper, 10 years before inflation. It is by Zunyaev and Zaldovich, and there was a corresponding paper by Peebles and you. And it shows why you get these acoustic oscillations in the microwave background in a beautiful way. So why you get these acoustic oscillations? So um, this is time. This is space. This is the Hubble radius. This is different scales. Uh, scales enter the Hubble radius. They oscillate for different uh, fractions of wavelengths. And therefore, you have these beautiful oscillations. You have baryon acoustic oscillations. You have the oscillations of the microwave background. It's all in this 1970 paper. OK. Now. Uh, what are some issues which I view as challenges for the inflationary paradigm? So that I'll give you a list. So the logic that I want to pursue is the following. I want to give you the list of what I per, uh, perceive to be uh, conceptual problems with inflation. And then given the list of these problems, I want you to allow me to consider the possibility that, they are, that there's an alternative scenario. And I will be assuming that this alternative scenario is based on superstring theory, which is, thank you very much, a theory of microscopic strings. So I'll be asking whether with string, superstring theory you can come up with a new and improved paradigm, new paradigm. More important than whether it's an improved paradigm or not is whether this paradigm can be tested in cosmological observations and distinguished from the current paradigm. So now the new paradigm may include inflation. And there are lots of talks this week at the KITP which discuss this approach. I'll be considering the other approach, the new paradigm, a new paradigm without inflation. So before giving you my list of conceptual problems of inflation, here's a brief review of inflation. So inflationary cosmology is based on using general relativity as a theory of space and time and describing matter using scalar fields. So we do homogeneous and isotropic cosmology, so the metric of space-time the line element, which gives the separation of space-time events, is given by dt squared minus a of t squared dx squared. The scale factor of the universe, which denotes the size of the spatial sections. Inflation is a phase in the early universe where the size of the spatial sections expands exponentially, or at least accelerates. And if you work in the context of general relativity, you need matter with negative pressure with pressure approximately equal to minus energy density. And in the context of renormalizable quantum field theories, this requires a scalar field. And in order to get inflation for a long time, this scalar field has to be slowly rolling. So this is the timeline of inflationary cosmology. 
there is a big bang in inflationary cosmology, then there's a finite length period during which the universe expands exponentially. And after that, all the energy gets transformed into the matter that we see today, and standard cosmology takes over. We are here today. So what will be important later on is the space-time diagram in string gas cosmology, which is analogous to this space-time diagram. So this is a space-time sketch of inflationary cosmology. Time, space, this is a period of inflation. This is a period of the standard Big Bang evolution. And I plot various wavelengths. First of all, I plot the Hubble radius, which many people call horizon, but they shouldn't call horizon. So the Hubble radius is defined as the inverse expansion rate of the universe. And as I will show quite a bit later in this talk, the Hubble radius divides scales where microphysics dominates, short wavelength scales, from scales where microphysics is frozen in, super Hubble scales. So that's the role of the Hubble radius. So if you want to produce fluctuations using microphysics, you have to produce them on wavelengths smaller than the Hubble radius. So the other blue curve is the horizon, the forward light cone of the Big Bang. And during this period of inflation, the horizon increases exponentially. So you have an exponentially growing difference between horizon and Hubble radius, which is why you better not call Hubble radius horizon. And then the third length scale is the physical length that corresponds to co-moving fluctuations. So you imagine this expanding sphere. You have plane wave perturbations of matter on this and matter of end curvature on this expanding sphere. The wavelength will stretch as the universe expands. So the physical wavelength here increases proportional to the scale factor A of T. And the beauty of inflation, this exponential expansion of space, is that while the Hubble radius is constant, the physical wavelength of co-moving fluctuations is expanding exponentially. So inflation provides a mechanism to bring fluctuations, which we see today on very large scales, into the Hubble radius at the beginning of the universe, and thus allowing a causal generation mechanism. And you see, the alternative mechanism that I will propose will have to satisfy that condition. And you'll see how. So this exponential expansion of space renders the universe large, homogeneous, and spatially flat. Classical matter redshifts. So if you have some kind of classical matter at the beginning of inflation, it will redshift away. And so matter approaches its vacuum state. And so you can postulate that the origin of fluctuations in inflationary cosmology is quantum vacuum fluctuations. This is the hypothesis which Chibizov and Mukhanov made in 1981. And that gave them this red curve, which I showed in the data. So in inflationary cosmology, you assume that everything that we see today starts out as quantum vacuum fluctuations. In the alternative scenario, structure that we see today is not starting out as quantum vacuum fluctuations. OK, here's my list of what I view as uh, challenges for the inflationary paradigm. First of all, what is the field that gives us inflation? And in the context of superstring theory, we have lots of candidates. And we are hearing a lot about this this week. A scalar field is not enough. You have to have a flat potential. You have to have the scalar field to be slowly rolling. And you have to have the right coupling of the scalar field to ordinary matter. Then after that, you have to adjust the parameters for the scalar field potential to get the right amplitude. And uh, just to give you a preview, um, in my alternative scenario of structure formation, I would get the amplitude of cosmological perturbations by just looking up in the 1980s textbook of superstring theory, the Green, Schwartz, and Witten textbook. Now, these problems I want to talk a little bit more about. The transplanctin problem. So this is the same space-time diagram that you've seen. It's a space-time sketch of inflation, but I've added one wavelength, namely the Planck length. So we know that we don't understand physics on wavelengths smaller than the Planck length or the string length. But if inflation lasts more than a minimal number of exponential expansion times, then the physical wavelength of the larger scales that we observe in nature today is smaller than the Planck length at the beginning of inflation. 
So we know that we don't understand the right physics. We don't have the right physics to describe cosmological perturbations in this phase. So new physics must enter into the calculation of what we see today. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's actually that's actually completely wrong, because what fluctuations are generated by some. They, they might start out in their vacuum state, but uh, and I was giving you a heuristic argument why they should st start in their vacuum state. But let's imagine a causal, uh, um, a Cauchy problem. We start in some state here. We have a Hamiltonian, and we actually start in the state which minimizes this, the Hamiltonian mode by mode. But then I assume that the evolution on Transplanckian scales is not adiabatic. If the evolution is not adiabatic, then you will find that when the perturbations reach Planck length, they will not be in their ground state. But it's, you know, there's no reason to assume that. No, but, but basically you've made hidden assumptions about what the physics is. Well, um, we, we don't understand physics on Transplanckian scales, and we can certainly have, we have, I can give you toy models of Lagrangians which give you large uh, Transplanckian effects. It's a microscope. Well, let's, let's talk about this later. This always. Uh, <laughs> What is special about inflation is that you have this exponential expansion. Right. But this is a this is a well known problem of 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 quantum gravity that, that in an expanding background there's something that we don't understand. Yeah. Yes. Now you. Right. Okay. Let me compare the situation in inflationary cosmology with the situation in ordinary standard Big Bang cosmology. Let's take ordinary standard Big Bang cosmology and let's assume that we set, off, uh, we set a Cauchy problem at the time when the energy density is Planck density. And then we are interested in fluctuations that we observe today. So then if you take those perturbations back into the early universe, then we are probing uh, wavelengths of one micrometer in standard cosmology. So in standard uh, Big Bang cosmology, I have to assume that fluctuations look like Minkowski fluctuations on one micrometer scales. In inflationary cosmology, I have to assume that uh, space and time looks like Minkowski space on, trans, on sub Planck scale wavelengths. So there's a difference. And the difference is exactly created by this exponential expansion of space. But okay, if you don't accept this criticism of inflation, that's okay. Um, I will mention some other problems. There's a singularity problem. Uh, in inflationary cosmology, there is still a big bang. So, so there is a period before inflation when matter was dominated by something that has positive pressure. The penrose hawking theorems apply, and so therefore there is a singularity. This was shown by Borde and Vilenkin, and later by Borde, Guth and Vilenkin. Okay, continuing my list. One of the things that I view as Achilles' heel of inflation is the following. There is this slight problem, the cosmological constant problem. Whenever you couple quantum matter to gravity, if you just take the quantum vacuum energy, you add up the uh, vacuum energy of all of the harmonic oscillators of each uh, matter mode, then you find that the um, resulting vacuum energy acts like a cosmological constant, which is 120 orders of magnitude <coughs> larger than what is observed. Now, there is some mechanism that we don't know that renders quantum vacuum energy inert. But in inflationary cosmology driven by a scalar field, we couple exactly part of the stress energy tensor to gravity, which looks like this vacuum energy. So well imagine mechanisms that solve a cosmological constant problem that uh, render scalar field driven inflation impossible. I could imagine that. 
but I don't have a solution of the cosmological constant problem, so I'm not going to address that. So then, in toy models of inflation, um, the scale, energy density scale at which inflation occurs is actually usually quite high. It's typically about 10 to the 16 GeV in simple scalar field models. So we know that at the string scale, terms in the gravitational effective action dominate, which are not the Einstein term. And the difference between the string scale and this scale is not that big. So maybe the, this uh, scale of inflation is too close to the Planck scale or the string scale to trust predictions made using So there's this high energy density zone of ignorance. There's a short wavelength zone of ignorance. Perturbations definitely uh, probe this zone of ignorance, and maybe even the, the background probes this zone of ignorance. So this is a list of reasons why I think you should consider the possibility that there might be a new paradigm of early universe cosmology. I'm going to make the hypothesis that this, hypo this paradigm is based on superstring theory, and I will explore the possibility that this paradigm will not involve inflation. This paradigm is called string gas cosmology. It was proposed by Kumun Waff and myself, and much more recently we figured out uh, that with this scenario you can have a new structure formation scenario. Okay. So preview, string gas cosmology makes testable predictions for observations, and the striking prediction is a blue tilt in the spectrum of gravitational waves. That means more power on short wavelengths than long wavelengths. Now, inflationary models predict a slight red tilt to the spectrum of gravitational waves, rather generically. So this is a nice and clean prediction. So if you're lucky, if the cosmic strings, if long cosmic strings are stable, then string gas cosmology would also produce line discontinuities in cosmic microwave and isotopy maps. These line discontinuities could have junctions. These junctions can be looked for in position space edge detection algorithms, and you get nice B-mode line discontinuities in cosmic microwave background and isotopy maps as well, which you can also look for with edge detection algorithms. Yes. Right. Yes. So the thing that's not is this. Okay, so now I'll introduce you to, the, to this alternate new scenario. Okay, now, given the fact that we uh, are not sure that we know what non perturbative superstring theory is, I'm going to present a toy model of early universe cosmology, and I want to stress that it's a toy model. And it's a toy model because I can illustrate it with toys like this <laughs> and with this as well. Okay, so, uh, but this toy model is based on what I view as fundamental ingredients of string theory, namely that matter is a gas of strings, fundamental strings. I will have to make the assumption that space is compact, all spatial dimensions, even the ones we live in. I don't need to assume that it's a torus, I'm just making this for mathematical simplicity. There are some mathematical criteria on this compact space, which we can discuss later on. Yeah, ask me that later. So, yeah, yes, the deep range, we um, come back to that, please, later on when I talk about modular stabilization. That's not going to be so long. So, what I want to do is I want to make use of the new degrees of freedom that string theory provides compared to point particle theory and uh, the new symmetries. Okay, and here's what I have to illustrate the new degrees of freedom. So for point particles on a compact space, so I have my compact space here with radius r, Point particles only have momentum. But fundamental strings have internal degrees of freedom, the oscillatory modes. 
Now, these oscillatory modes lead you to the fact that there's a maximal temperature for a gas of strings, namely the Hagedorn temperature. So that's a consequence of the presence of string oscillatory modes. Now, st strings, since they are extended objects, can also wind a compact space. They are string winding modes. And so the fact that string winding modes could have a, an important effect on space, you can just visualize this way. They will prevent space from expanding. You have to break a string if you want to make space expand. Now, the presence of string winding modes also leads you to this new symmetry, which is a, it's a part of key duality. Physics at large R is equivalent to physics at small r. So if I take the free... Yes. This was a, this was a heuris very heuristic approach, and we'll come back to that later. Yeah, right. There's no object. I'll be. I'll, Sorry. We, we come back to that when I. But anyway, so you see, these are the ingredients I want to use in a toy model context. And we can then argue if that's the correct toy model. Okay, so the energies of the momentum states are proportional to 1 over the radius. The energy of winding modes is obviously proportional. Well, obviously, it's, at least heuristically, it's proportional to the radius. So the duality is if you take r into 1 over r in string units, and if you exchange momentum and winding numbers, then you have a symmetry in the mass spectrum of string states. It's a symmetry of the vertex operators, and therefore it should be a symmetry. Uh, and if you want it to be a symmetry at the non-perturbative level, then you get to the existence of d brains. Now we get to the d brains. Okay. So now if I take a box of strings, of radius r, and I look at how the temperature changes as I reduce the size of the box. What I find is that initially, when the box has large size, when the energy is predominantly in the momentum modes, the temperature will rise as the box decreases, like for regular point particles. But once you approach this maximal temperature, then the energy will drift into the new states, into these oscillatory modes, and then into the winding modes. And so as you cross this dual radius, r equals 1 in string units, the temperature will start going down again. So the temperature radius curve has this form. There is no temperature singularity as a function of radius, unlike what happens in point particle cosmology where you have a curve like this. So there's at least the hope that you can imagine that within the context of string cosmology, there is a resolution of the uh, temperature singularity. OK, so now we want to do dynamics. And so we need to know how the radius changes and the temperature changes as a function of time. And here's where some problems start. So where should we put our initial conditions? One possibility is that we start in this metastable point, that we live here for a long time and then roll off. That's one set of initial conditions. You could also imagine that you start very small with a lot of uh, R dot, and that you sort of roll over this temperature hill. I don't know which the right initial conditions are. I'll be taking one choice. And my cosmology will depend on that choice. So again, the temperature time scenarios that you can get is either this type, that you sit at the metastable point for a long time and then roll off. This is called an emergent universe track. And then there's a track where the temperature bounces as a function of time. So these are the kind of, temp of uh, temperature time curves that you should expect, radius time curves. So I will be now assuming that we are in this track, emergent track. We sit for a long time in this high temperature phase where the temperature is close to the Hagedorn temperature. And then we roll off into the usual radiation phase of standard cosmology. And this rolling off is generated by string winding modes intersecting and forming string loops. And string loops is radiation. 
So this process, the transition from a phase dominated by winding strings to a phase where there are very few winding strings, that's going to give this transition. Now you can argue, as we did many years ago, that this process will only allow three of the nine spatial dimensions of superstring theory to liberate, and so there's a possible explanation for why there are only three large dimensions of space. But there are some important caveats to this argument. This, class, class, this argument is based on classical strings, and that's related to some of these caveats. OK, let's. OK, so you see, you are coming from the view from, from the intuition that we have from general relativity. So if we sit here, then you could equally well go this direction or this direction. You have a symmetry. And so even though I, ca I can't give you a low energy effect of action that implements it, but I don't expect that the Einstein action is in any way a good approximation here. It doesn't have the right symmetries. It doesn't, it doesn't re, uh, reflect the T-duality that we know string theory has. It doesn't reflect S-dualities. But what, what is true is once you enter the phase where three of the dimensions are microscopic, yes. the other six are being wrapped by a gas. Yes. It's true that the energy density in those other six Correct. would actually decrease if Correct. the radii expand. Correct. Make, so, so make the. Think that we can a large they, in this phase, definitely yes, and I will be doing that, and I'll be moving. I agree. I agree. We don't. I can't give you an effective field theory that gives us this, this background. But I'm arguing from. Uh, yes. So now let's, let's look at what happens to the other dimensions, the six dimensions which are in which the winding strings cannot annihilate. So I have <clears throat> two, trans, two slides here, and then I have a whole section prepared later on. So if there are questions here, since this is a colloquium, I'm going to refer you to this section. So heuristically what, what happens is that Winding modes prevent the extra dimensions from expanding. Momentum modes prevent the extra dimensions from shrinking to zero size. There's a preferred size for all of the extra radii, namely string scale. And uh, you can analyze this problem by taking Einstein gravity in um, four space-time dimensions plus six. You can assume that the dilaton is fixed by hand. And then in, you can focus on special string states, in, which occur in heterotic string theory, these enhanced symmetry states. And then you can show that the radions, one by one, are all kept finite. This is, comes from the nine plus one dimensional anisotropic gravity equations. The size moduli are all stabilized in a natural way. And you can show that the shape moduli, so if you imagine that two of these extra dimensions form a torus, shape modulus is an angle of a torus, angle is theta. This, in the, uh, this uh, nine dimensional cosmology, nine plus one dimensional cosmology, this angle theta performs damped harmonic oscillation about angle 90 degrees. So that's a dynamical stabilization of the shape moduli as well. No, the, uh, I'm not talking about a mass. I'm just talking about this angle. The angle is driven to 90 degrees. You want me? Yeah. So, okay. So, right. Now, these are non-symmetry states from the point of view of R3 plus one dimensional cosmology today. They look like radiation, an exoneutrino species. But we can talk about that later from it. It's a preview of the exosection. Okay. Now, the only modulus which we don't have control 
of from string theory alone, or for, so from this classical ideas of strings, is a dilaton. And there, what we've done, and what we means Rebecca Donis, Andrew Frey, and myself, we've used the mechanism of Gagino condensation to give the dilaton a potential with a unique minimum. So we were able to stabilize the dilaton that way, and we were able to show that dilaton stabilization does not mess up the size stabilization. Okay. So now I want to move on and show you how this string gas cosmology gives rise to a new mechanism of structure formation. Then later on we can come back to some of these issues. Okay. So we want to calculate fluctuations of matter and fluctuations of the metric which evolve from this cosmology because we want to calculate the large-scale structure in our universe and we want to calculate microwave background anisotropies. The two are coupled. So the reason we can do this calculation is that fluctuations are small today on large scales. Since gravity was, is attractive, fluctuations were even smaller in the early universe. Therefore, we can do linear perturbation theory to calculate the fluctuations. And doing this linear fluctuation analysis, we find that on sub-Hubble scales, matter fluctuations dominate. You get matter oscillations. On super-Hubble scales, the metric fluctuations dominate. Matter fluctuations are frozen out. So now, a couple of technical slides. How does this come about? So we take the metric, which now includes fluctuations, space, time-dependent fluctuations. So we've added them to our homogeneous and isotropic background. So in blue is everything that's homogeneous and isotropic. The red are the fluctuations, which depend on space and time. If matter is a scalar field, we have a background and fluctuations. So what we do is we insert this ansatz for the metric and for matter into the action of the system, which is Einstein action plus whatever matter action you have. For example, scalar field matter action. And without doing any calculations, you know that the result, the quadratic action that will describe the linear perturbations, is given by a free field action in a with a time-dependent mass, because you have a free field system in a time-dependent background. So without doing any calculations, you know that the action for cosmological perturbations will take this form. And you have to do a tedious calculation to find out how this canonically normalized field is related to the basic perturbations and what the time dependence of the mass actually is. And these are the results. This variable is called the mukhanov sasaki variable. And if the equation of state of the background is constant, then z is proportional to the scale factor. So the equation of motion that arises from this action is simply a harmonic mode by mode. In Fourier space, it's a harmonic oscillator equation with this time-dependent mass. And from this, you see that if you look at small wavelengths, wavelengths where k is larger than the Hubble expansion rate square, uh, Hubble expansion rate, that you then get oscillations like in flat space time. Whereas on long wavelengths, small values of k, the, this term becomes ineffective and v behaves as dictated by the background. So on scales larger than the Hubble radius, the evolution of the fluctuations is dominated by the background. Now in inflationary cosmology, we complete the system of equations by vacuum initial conditions mode by mode. In my alternative, I will be using different initial conditions. So this formalism, which I illustrated in the past two transparencies, can be applied to any model of the very early universe, not just to inflation. So here's the space-time diagram of inflation. So we are tracking a particular fluctuation mode from its beginning to when we observe it today. It is generated as a quantum vacuum perturbation early on. It does quantum vacuum oscillations until it exits the radius. Then it becomes squeezed, it becomes classical, and we measure it today. But I want to apply this theory to string gas cosmology, to this background, where the scale factor is constant early on, and then it has a standard cosmology evolution. So the scale factor is constant, means h equals 0, means Hubble radius infinite. So my space-time diagram doesn't look like this, but it looks like this. So this is the Hagedorn phase, static, so the Hubble radius is infinite. Then the universe starts to expand, so the Hubble radius does this curve. And 
fluctuation modes, they evolve like in standard cosmology until the end of the Hagedorn phase, but the universe is static here, and so the wavelength is just constant in the Hagedorn phase. And wavelengths that we are talking about, micrometer wavelengths. Sorry, can you say again what, what this equation is being solved? No, here I'm not solving any equations, I'm just translating this background. I'm drawing the space time diagram which, which, which follows from making this assumption. So this is the input, scale factor as a function of time, and then... No, there's not a dynamical. Okay. But anyway, so given this... So now, given this space-time sketch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the matter fluctuations, mode by mode on sub-Hubble scales, compute the metric perturbations which are induced when the modes exit the Hubble radius, and then I will evolve the metric perturbations to the present time. So that's a three-step procedure. Calculate the initial matter fluctuations, convert them to metric fluctuations, evolve the metric fluctuations. It's the same procedure we do in inflationary cosmology. Okay. Now I'm going to calculate gravitational waves and scalar metric perturbations at the same time. So in this ansatz for the metric, I'm going to include gravitational waves. So H is traceless uh, transverse tensor. These are the scalar metric fluctuations. So if I insert this metric into the perturbed Einstein equations, I find that the scalar metric fluctuations are determined by the energy density fluctuations, and the gravitational waves are determined by the anisotropic pressure perturbations. I didn't write down I not equal to J. So the idea is now I will take string gas cosmology to compute these quantities, and then I will compute the metric quantities mode by mode at the time that the uh, scales exit the Hubble radius, and then I will evolve these quantities at late times using the perturbed Einstein equation, and then I'll have my predictions. So I just want to focus on the, base, on the way that we've done the calculations. So string theory will enter in the ev evolution of these, evaluation of these quantities. Okay. So, now, the energy, den energy density, f okay, in inflationary cosmology, we started out in the vacuum matter set, with the matter in its vacuum state. But here, in string gas cosmology, we have a dense gas of strings, and so the energy density is dominated by this dense gas of strings, so we have to use thermal dynamic fluctuations. And in general, when you have thermal fluctuations, the energy density fluctuations are given by the specific E capacity this way. And if you calculate the specific heat capacity in a compact space of a gas of strings, and you do this calculation near the Hagedorn temperature, then you get the result that the specific heat capacity scales as R square, not as R cubed. A way to understand this result is that long winding strings in three dimensions look like point particles in two dimensions, and so therefore you should get the specific heat scaling that's like you get for point particles in two dimensions. Now the result obviously comes from the partition function of a thermal string gas, but this is what I just gave you as a heuristic way of understanding this result. So now this is the calculation of the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations, what astronomers want to know. So the power spectrum of phi is defined as phi in Fourier space square times the phase space factor K cubed. The phi is related to the density perturbations. Density perturbations are related to mass fluctuations. Mass fluctuations are given by the energy density fluctuations in position space. Those are given by thermal fluctuations by the specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity are calculated. I get this. So I'm not uh, omitting any step here. This is a complete calculation. And this gives you the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations mode by mode as a function of the basic parameters. So you see that K has disappeared. 
So we get a scale invariant spectrum of cosmological fluctuations like in inflation. Now, if you look a little bit carefully, you have to ask, what is the temperature that enters this calculation? Well, it's a temperature when you do the conversion between matter and metric fluctuations. And that temperature depends slightly on time. So the temperature for short wavelength modes is slightly lower than for large wavelength modes, because mo short wavelength modes exit the Hubble radius slightly late at a slightly lower temperature. So you get a slight red tilt for cosmological perturbations, like in inflation. Are these modes phase correlated? Yes. They are phase correlated because they get squeezed on super Hubble scales. So they are not phase correlated uh, when they are produced. They're just thermal fluctuations. But then they get squeezed in the same direction, mode by mode, uh, while they are super Hubble. And I have that on, I stress that on the next slide. But um, before doing that, let me just emphasize that I've also given you the amplitude of the cosmological perturbations. They depend on the ratio between the string length and the Planck length, and they depend on how close you are to the Hagedon temperature in the Hagedon phase. So if I assume that this fact is of order 1, and I go to the green schwartz written textbook, and I look at their preferred value of the string length, I find the right amplitude of perturbations, consistent with the Observation. Uh, I think we might have asked this before, but you drew this curve of the behavior of the scale factor. Right. Now you're studying the temperature at which modes are being created close to the high order temperature. Yep. And to answer an earlier question, you told us you did not actually have an action to govern the system when it was supposed to. But I have the thermodynamics. So you say this is a prediction of thermodynamics without right. any action to translate the thermodynamics into how the metric is. For the fluctuations. For the fluctuations, yes. How do you know how the metric is responding without an action? Ah, uh, okay. Let me. Let me jump. Let me jump to uh, this. So I've made three assumptions to get the, this conclusion. I've assumed that there's a Hagedorn phase, including static dilaton. New physics is required, and I only have words for this. I don't have an action. Then I need this holographic scaling of a specific heat capacity. And then what I've also done is I've used the Einstein equations for fluctuations on one millimeter wavelength. So these are the three assumptions. So the background? The behavior of the background comes from which No, the, the, back, the behavior of the background is put in. I just have words to justify that. The symmetry arguments. The background which gives this static Hagedorn phase is not present now. I just argued by... If I understand correctly, I think Thomas' question is, how do you understand the evolution of the metric? Even, even given a strong assumption of form 1, how do you understand the, the evolution of the metric takes the form 2? Okay, but, so once you have... See, once... I, so I, I'll give you the scale factor as a function of time. Then I get this. I have the temperature as a function of time now. No, that, that's the point. I, I, don't, I can't give you that. So I just, the scale that's the assumption. That's number one. That's the assumption. OK. Yes. And the argument is that I have this symmetric point. I'm, I said I have a metastable point. This metastable point, the dynamics could drive you either positive or negative. Uh, it could lead you to either expansion or contraction, and the two are equivalent, so I expect this to be a metastable state. I would like to have something better, and I'm working on something better. Okay, now, so far, I have only have post-dictions. So now I'm running quite late, because I don't want to go over time. So um, I'm going to get to the predictions. So. We haven't observed gravitational waves yet, so that's why this is a prediction. So I'm going to repeat the same calculation as before, but for gravitational waves. So it's the anisotropic stress that enters, the anisotropic stress fluctuations. I can calculate the anisotropic stress fluctuations also from um, string thermodynamics. And uh, putting the two together, I get this result. So again. I get a scale invariant spectrum for gravitational waves. But if I look at the temperature dependence, then I see that 
large scales exit the Hubble radius when the temperature is closer to the Hagedorn temperature, where this factor is closer to zero. So I don't get a red spectrum of gravitational waves, but a blue spectrum of gravitational waves. A heuristic way to understand that result is that large scales exit the Hubble radius when pressure is closer to zero. Therefore, the pressure fluctuations are smaller. So I get a slight blue tilt of the spectrum of gravitational waves, unlike for inflation. And that's a prediction. I'm sorry, is that the same ratio? You can predict, you predicted that from Yes. OK, so now we have two free parameters in this calculation, the string length divided by the Planck length, and how close to the uh, Hagedorn temperature you are in the Hagedorn phase. Two free parameters, we can calculate at least four things. We can calculate the uh, amplitude of the scalar fluctuations, the amplitude of the tensor fluctuations, and the two spectral indices. And to give you an example of how we could do the calculation, we could take the current amplitude of the scalar cosmological perturbations and the best fit slope to fix these two parameters, and then we can calculate the scalar to tensor ratio and the tensor slope. What we would get then is a tensor to scalar ratio of about 10 to the minus 4 and a slope of about 0 0.04. So and now you can change the parameters. And so happy with that answer at least? With the other, I can't, I can't satisfy you with the other one. OK, so now let me just uh, end by focusing on some extra nice predictions which you could have if the cosmic superstrings, which wind R dimensions, there will be some cosmic superstrings winding R dimensions if they are stable. So and some of you will tell me if, the, if they are going to be stable in, in your models. If the tension is normal, then See, that's now going to be a, f a fifth observable. Yes, 10 to the 17 is, is ruled out. So, uh, OK. So let me go to this graph. So if you have a cosmic string or a cosmic superstring which is pointing out of the board and it is moving in this direction, then if we sit here and we look at the microwave radiation coming to us, then because of the fact that there's a deficit angle in space, you will have a Doppler shift between this photon and this photon. And this Doppler shift will be in a line. It will form a line coming out. So this is what I wrote down here. This is how the angle deficit is related to the tension of the string by Newton's constant. This is the temperature uh, jump. And so you will predict if the cosmic superstrings are stable, you will predict a network of line discontinuities in the cosmic microwave background. Now, you'll have them on scales all the way from one degree in the sky to 90 degrees in the sky. But the most numerous will be one degree in the sky. They'll come from the time of recombination. So in order to see these line discontinuities, we need good angular resolution, not necessarily large sky coverage. So something like the South Pole Telescope is ideal. So the next couple of pictures come from South Pole Telescope simulations. So this is a 10 by 10 degree uh, patch in the sky. And again, temperature, this color coding means different temperatures. And what you see here is the noise that would come from thermal string fluctuations or from inflationary fluctuations. Now, if there were none of that and only cosmic strings, you would have this picture. Beautiful picture, extremely different. Why but are they straight? That's not a fact of the way that we model it. There'll be lines, and they will not necessarily be straight. And therefore, you can't look for these effects using um, what, match filtering. You have to be a little more clever to look for these, because the edges generically will, will be curved. OK, so now, <clears throat> in string gas cosmology, or in inflationary cosmology coming from brain, world models, um, deep brain annihilation models, you will have this signal at about 1 to 10% of the strength of this signal. OK, so the challenge is to see that. OK, so there's another signal. This cosmic string will also produce a wake. And a wake is an overdensity behind the string the density is twice the background density, 
And these overdensities will exist beginning recombination all the way to the present time. So here again is my deficit angle, the string moving in this direction. These points indicate gas points. And if you now put yourself onto this point in space, then it appears to you that the gas is moving towards you from both directions with a velocity perturbation, which is the velocity of the string times relativistic gamma factor times this deficit angle. So these wakes will contain more electrons, more free electrons. And so therefore, they will give extra polarization. And since the string is uncorrelated with the axis of the C and B quadrupole, statistically, an equal contribution of E and B modes will be, is predicted. And the signal is strongest for wakes produced at the earliest time that are accessible, that are visible in the microwave background, namely recombination. So a typical length scale would be about one degree, and you will get pictures like this. So this is now the. You, you know, th this, you, you're not talking in the context of string gas cosmology? Yeah, can you switch context? Uh, no, I can certainly go back to string gas cosmology. So if the cosmic superstrings are stable, there will be two contributions to the power spectrum. One from the thermal string gas, and the other one from the cosmic superstrings. Cosmic now, the, the same tension or different tension from the string? The same tension. Now, you see the amplitude that I got for the power spectrum. Sorry, there'll be an equation. P phi was proportional to uh, Planck length divided by string length to the fourth power times this. OK? We expect the temperature to be close to the Hagedon temperature. So I can live with much smaller uh, string tensions than 10 to the 17 GV. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm now going away from the number uh, from the value in green schwartz emitting. I'm making it a little bit lower. But again, I have one more observable as well that I want to fit. OK, so this is a signal that you should look for in polarization maps. You have a sharp edge here, and you have a rectangle in the sky, and you have a dimin uh, the gradient, the polarization gradient is decreasing in this direction. This is the leading edge of, this, of the string, the trailing edge of the string. So the string has started its motion here. One Hubble time later, it is here. OK, now here, this is a Q-mode polarization map. It is Gaussian noise from inflation and 100 times the cosmic string signal at this value, 3 times 10 to the minus 7. So if you now go to B-mode, this signal should be clearly manifest. OK, good. So now the way to look for these signals signals, both in the temperature maps and in the polarization maps, is to stay in position space. You want to look at an edge detection algorithm, which is better than matched filtering, because we don't know that the edges are going to be straight. And so there's a Berkeley um, engineer, Canny, who developed an edge detection algorithm to find uh, distinct features in visual images, or to find cracks in metals. So what we did is we implemented this Kani algorithm for microwave uh, maps. So the idea is you take a map, you find the edges across which the gradient of the map is in the correct range to correspond to the signal that you're looking for. And then what you do is you compare maps with the signal and maps without the signal, or you compare theoretical maps with observational maps, and then you can uh, take the edge length distribution, you can do a Fisher combined probability test, and you can get constraints or find uh, observations. So this was very quick. Just, so preliminary results indicate that with the data from the South Pole Telescope, you will be able to set a limit on the cosmic string tension, which is one order of magnitude better than the current limits. And I don't have the answers yet for the polarization, because that's in progress. But more than that, I want to go to the overall conclusions. So um, I hope to have, first of all, motivated to you to look beyond inflationary cosmology as a theory of the very old universe. 
I presented to you a toy model, a stringy toy model of the very early universe called string gas cosmology. It has a chance of providing a non-singular cosmology. It has a chance of providing a natural explanation for the large number, for the number of large dimensions that we see today. And it gives rise to a new structure formation scenario. And according to this structure formation scenario, we are the remnants of string fluctuations in the early universe. We are not the remnant of vacuum fluctuations in an inflationary phase. This scenario makes a prediction. It predicts a scaling band spectrum of gravitational waves with a small blue tilt, in addition to predict to uh, getting the cosmological perturbations right. And if we are lucky that these uh, strings are stable, then we get a network of cosmic superstrings at all times, and they will give rise to nice position space effects in the microwave background. So, and you see, this is what I meant by saying that string theory is testable in cosmological observations. Now, unfortunately, I didn't present you a string theory that gives rise to these nice predictions. As several of the questions indicated, there was one key step where everything was toy model, motivated by words. And this was exactly where I put in this background. So that's why I presented you a toy model, motivated by, by string theory, using some key ingredients of string theory, and I get these predictions. But if you were to find a blue tilt of gravitational waves, all of you string theorists could now say, ah, this was first predicted by string theory. So thanks. That depends on how big they were in the hugged-on phase. Oh, they were. Oh, I, I thought they were seeing a self-dual point. I thought the whole point was they were seeing no. self-dual point. Okay, this, can I, um, you're bringing up something that is also going to be a weak point of our scenario. Because so, I think if you follow, I think you, you predict right? that the period is much smaller than the current yep. price. So, so like, what, some of the, the success of inflation, the success of inflation is not just that you have a, mechanism of structure formation, but also that you were able to solve, you were able to explain the large size of the universe. Okay. Now, if you start with all dimensions string scale without introducing extra ad hoc but brainy things, I cannot get the large size of our three dimensions. Now, if this string phase is part of a bouncing scenario, which may well turn out, then there'd be no problem in that respect. If the, if the Hagedorn phase lasts more than one light millimeter, the, the horizon problem is solved. So the horizon problem is solved automatically if you have the size, almost automatically. I guess I'm confused because I know that if we follow that, our universe, right. the, the temperature becomes funky and well before the horizon size becomes small. Right? That's right. It's one, 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 that's where this one micrometer came from. So our current Hubble radius is one micrometer at the string scale. So any theory better have standard Big Bang cosmology set in when our spatial dimensions are one micrometer. And there's this, hi this hierarchy between string scale and one micrometer, which I have not explained here. There are different ways of getting it. The nicest way is if this is part of a bouncing scenario. Right. The other six stay small. Yep. You use this fact that winding modes have yep. tension, they go quite far. Right. And I think uh, that would give actually a contribution to the energy density that would encourage expansion of the other six dimensions from an elementary calculation of density gravity. So, what's your argument that, in fact, the dimensions okay. stay there um, okay. So, this is what we've done. We've done gravity in 10 dimensions, we've coupled it to a string gas, and we've put in dilaton stabilization right now by hand. But it will come. So, what we are, what we are doing, so we are taking a perfect fluid ansatz for the action for matter, but it comes from the string gas. And here we use our enhanced symmetry states. Okay. So now we we solve the Einstein equations 
in the anisotropic setting are scale factor. These are the radions. So we have the induced pressures around R dimensions and around the extra dimensions. So the winding and momentum quantum numbers are around the other dimensions. So these pressures are different. OK? So now we solve the equations. And what we find is we find that in the heterotic string for the enhanced symmetry states, this is 0 if you set that to self-dual radius. Now, you can ask, how do these modes enter into the equations of motion for our scale factor? And the answer is they enter as radiation. So it will be a neutrino. It will be like an extra neutrino. And the exact number density depends slightly on initial conditions. OK, so this shows that these, or well, I would claim that based on these calculations, we show the modes that are winding the extra dimensions, they keep the extra dimensions compact, and they don't mess up cosmology in R dimensions. So what do you have to check? You have to check no fifth forces. You actually have to check that the radion is confined um, to sufficient strength that you cannot excite it at the LHC. Right. Yeah, I, if you take a one brain and you wrap it around a single dimension in 10 dimensions, yeah. naively its energy goes like r. Yeah. Let's say all the extra dimensions have the same radius r. You know, dimensionally reduced from 10 to 4 dimensions. Right. The rescaling to Einstein brain multiplies the energy densities by 1 over r as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, any known brain that wraps right. the extra dimensions has an energy that rapidly falls to the power of 1 over r. Mm -hmm. So any density of those winding modes, just from the analysis I mentioned, which is elementary, uh, we'll, we'll no, but, you, right. but let me mention where the difference is. Okay. You, you explicitly mentioned one brain. What these are, these are the enhanced symmetry states of heterotic string theory. These are not just, if you, if, you, if you take away the enhanced symmetry states, if you just look at a state with winding number and no momentum numbers, this analysis breaks, it doesn't hold. No, we find. Well, the thing but is, if, if, you're, if you've got this enhanced right. symmetry point, you've got a gap of stuff that is mm -hmm. you know, trapping you there. As Ian said, an hour ago, I think, that um, that gap uh, itself forces expansion of the universe. And self consistently, you can solve those equations very easily, and the universe expands with gaps that are loose. Mm -hmm. And this mechanism for stabilizing the, the modulus at the belt, at the enhanced symmetry point, uh, what it's uh, no no it's it's we've we've done the calculation so the, if it's temporary okay but so this is now a question which we should pursue this is technical question but I would claim that we've we, we have control of that we've calculated the force that keeps B compact that keeps B to the self dual radius we've done we've done linear fluctuations around that we can calculate the mass that keeps Keep we, that's taken into account? We've taken that into account? So what is the, what is the mass? What you mean the, the, the force? OK, let me go on. Maybe I have something prepared. No, that I don't have. OK, what we do is we take B to be self-dual point plus gamma. We have a harmonic oscillator, damped harmonic oscillator equation for gamma. We have the mass term that enters into that equation. That mass term depends on time. It contains a redshifting. We verify that it's big enough today. Uh, what, is, uh, what is big enough? Big enough? I have to look up the exact numbers, but. This is a gas of massless particles. No, it's, a ga no, it's not a gas. It's a gas of massless particles. No, no, no. It's a, it's a gas of, of if you're sitting at B equals zero, yeah, yeah. these are massless. Today? 
Yeah, they get Yes. Yes. It is. That's why the scales. Yes. It gets weaker. But it's still sufficiently strong. You have to accept that we've done the calculation. It's rich. It's rich. It's it lack. Yeah. That's right. And it's it's way subdominant. So what we've checked, we've, we've calculated the abundance, the energy density in that stuff today from our four-dimensional perspective. We've looked, for fifth, we've, we've looked at the strength which, w with which B is kept equal to uh, 1 in string units. Uh, what else have we done? We've done a couple of other things. But, but sorry, could, could you just say <coughs> how is it that a very subdominant radiation species can overpower omega lambda? We haven't included the current cosmological constant. So there's a... So whether this stabilization mechanism will be effective um, a billion years from now, once the cosmological constant has become dominant, that I don't know. It may, it may lose its power. The same is that it's powerful enough today. It's the same about today. But obviously, that, so you see, the, this discussion is all about the modular stabilization. <laughs>